Welcome back to the GCN Racing News Show. Coming up this week, Slovenia becomes a cycling powerhouse with Primoz Roglic and Tadej Pogaccio impressing at the Vuelta Espana. Matthew van der Poel's in a league of his own at the Tour of Britain. We also have the Grand Prix of Quebec and Montreal, the Copa Agostonian Bernocchi, the Madrid Challenge, the first round of the Cyclocross World Cup and the latest transfer and retirement news. <laughs> The final week of the Vuelta Espana proved just as dramatic and tough as the previous two. One man, though, remained steadfast throughout, Primoz Roglic. He'd taken the jersey after the Stage 10 time trial, and as it would turn out, it would be the final change in the lead of the race. He was Mr. Consistency, and that's what wins you Grand Tours, as well as a good team, of course. And Jumbo Visma really rose to the occasion, despite losing Steven Kreisweik early on. It marked the first Grand Tour victory for Roglic, the first for Slovenia. Slovenia and the second in the history of the team, the only other being the Giro d'Italia in 2009 with Denny Menshoff. It was only a matter of time though for Roglic, you've got to say, especially when you look at his list of results in stage races over the last couple of seasons. As posted here by Matti Pierali on Twitter, he's won seven of his last ten stage races and hasn't finished out the top four in any of them. Now, somewhat ironically, given the title of last week's racing news show, it was Quintana who came the closest to upsetting Roglic and his team. Also ironic was the fact that it came on one of the flattest stages of the race. Exposed roads, cross and tailwinds, and a very aggressive peloton combined to give us one of the fastest races over 200 kilometers in the history of the sport. 50.6 kilometers an hour on stage 17. A group of almost 50 riders went clear in the opening kilometers and were never seen again. At one point, Quintana was closing in on the virtual race lead, but Roglic was lucky to have Astana chasing full ball behind in the finale. It was Philip Gilbert though who was the fastest of them all. The stats from that final part of the stage where they had a tailwind really are quite mind-boggling. Check out these numbers from Sam Bennett. Most impressive one for me on that list, a peak 30 minutes of 63 kilometers an hour. George Bennett described it as the queen stage of his career and a lot of other riders in the race also described it as one of, if not the toughest race of their career. It just goes to show that it's the riders who make a race, not the parkour. Although a decent dose of crosswinds never goes amiss. In the end though, it had little to do with the bearing on the outcome of the race. Quintana was never quite at his best in the mountains and would slip off the podium by the finish in Madrid. The man replacing him was Tadej Pogacar, who was amongst the youngest riders to stand on a Grand Tour podium in the last 100 years. This was pointed out by Café Roubaix on Twitter. Only three other riders under the age of 21 have achieved that. Copy, Jimenez and Baron Kelly. Not a bad list of names to join. Pogacar underlines the fact that it's been a season of emerging talent, or not even emerging anymore. The young talent is here and now, and it's been great to witness. That said, the previous generation isn't done yet either. Alejandro Balverde stood on the podium yesterday as the runner-up at the age of 39. Pogaccia was just short of his fifth birthday when Valverde stood on the podium for the first time in the Vuelta. Incredible, really, when you think about it. On top of that, Philippe Gilbert confirmed himself as one of the favourites for the upcoming World Championships in Yorkshire at the age of 37 by taking two stage wins in impressive fashion. The Koenig Quickstep had a total of five wins and almost bagged themselves a top 10 on the GC with James Knox. Unfortunately though, this crash on stage 19 left him bruised and battered and he'd end up 11th after suffering through the final day. Hats off to him for getting through that stage at all though with those injuries. If you want to see exactly how hard the final mountain stage was, look no further than these stats from Team Dimension Data's Ben King five and a half hours in the saddle, an average power of 290 watts and a normalized power of 335 watts. I've got pain in my legs just thinking about that. A man though who deserves a special mention who did make it into the top 10 on GC is Carl Frederick Hagen, having never ridden a Grand Tour before, but at the age of 27, he became the first Norwegian cyclist ever to finish in the top 10 overall. He might not have been on our screens particularly much, but that was a ride as impressive as anyone's. Congratulations, Carl. Also impressive was Thomas de Ghent. He may not have won a stage, 
but he's the only rider this year to have ridden and finished all three Grand Tours. I particularly enjoyed his tweet from the morning of the final stage. Final race of the season for me, others would say, let's make it count, but not for me. Before we finish with the well, to hear the results of last week's poll, we asked you if Naira Quintana will ever finish on a Grand Tour podium again, and 79% of you said no. Controversial. Also concluding at the weekend was the Tour of Britain, which was basically all about one man, Matthew van der Poel. Although, maybe that's slightly unfair on everyone else. Dylan Groenewegen took three sprint wins on one, three and five, while first year pro Eduardo Affini impressed with a win in the time trial on stage six. The overall GC though was a battle between van der Poel and Trentin. The Italian went into the leader's jersey after his stage two win, but lost it to van der Poel on stage four. The Dutchman's win there was incredibly impressive. He backed that up with a second equally impressive win on stage seven. There, Trentin looked to be in a perfect position on Van der Poel's wheel up the final climb that there was just nothing he could do once he kicked for the final time. A shrug of the shoulders and a thumbs up to Van der Poel was all he could do in response, but it was a nice tribute to see. Van der Poel then backed that up with a third win on the final stage, wrapping up the overall classification in the process. He's now a firm favorite, you'd say, for the upcoming World Championships in Yorkshire, if he wasn't already. From a personal point of view though, having been traveling around commentating on the Tour of Britain and seeing firsthand the crowd's response to him, I have to say that he's one of the best things that has happened to our sport. He's inspiring a whole generation of riders, which is brilliant to see. The race also marked the final competitive outing for Mark Renshaw he will be best known for being one of the best lead out riders the sport has ever seen, shepherding Mark Cavendish to a huge number of victories. And so it was fitting that he crossed the line somewhat emotionally on Saturday with Cavendish and Bernie Eisel alongside him. Congratulations on your career, Mark. You are this week's GCN Rider of the Week. Meanwhile, over in Canada, we had the Grand Prix of Quebec and Montreal two races that are growing in prestige year on year. In the former, we had a battle between some of the best one-day riders in the sport. Sagan, Alaphilippe and Van Avermaet went away in a group on the final lap. However, they were all trumped in the end by a fast finishing Michael Matthews who took the win there for the second year in a row. Yet another rider you could have down as a big favorite for the world championships. Yesterday, it was Van Avermaet who took the spoils in Montreal. The Belgian won from a small group in a particularly tough sprint, getting the better of Diego Ulisi and Ivan Garcia Cortina to take his third win of the season so far. The final weekend of La Vuelta also coincides with the two-day Madrid challenge. It kicked off with a 9.3 kilometer individual time try in Boadilla del Monte, which was held on slick roads around the city. Former world champion Lisa Brenau was the winner by 10 seconds for WNT Rota ahead of two somewhere riders, Lucinda Brandt and Penilla Matheson. The German rider took the leader's jersey into the following day, which on a fast city circuit with many bonus seconds on offer, it was always gonna be difficult for any breaks to get clear and none really enjoyed more than 20 seconds. Brand and Brenauer were fighting it out in the sprints with a somewhere rider at one stage closing the gap to three seconds. The inevitable bunch sprint was on the cars and with the rain once again making the roads slick, there were some crashes. Chloe Hosking of LA Cipollini demonstrating one of the most patient sprints I've seen in a while, leading through the final corner and then just waiting while everyone started their sprint before she kicked to hold off Letizia Paternoster of Trek Sega Fredo and Roxanne Fournier of Movistar for her first World Tour victory of the year. Brenauer though ran out the overall winner by 10 seconds from Brandt and her Sunweb teammate, Penilla Matheson. Whilst not in Spain, Annemiek van Vluten still leads the Women's World Tour with one race to go. In Italy, we had the first two of 12 one-day races that litter the autumn, culminating with Il Lombardia in a few weeks' time. On Saturday at the Coppa Agostoni, former under-23 European champion Alexander Rybashenko took his first pro victory, impressively outsprinting Alexei Lutsenko, who he'd been away with for the final 40 kilometers. The following day at the 101st edition of Coppa Bernocchi, we had a reduced bunch sprint, which was marred by a nasty crash 500 meters 
to go. Coming through unscathed though was Phil Bauhaus, taking his first win since February of 2018. Last week's four-stage Lotto Belgium tour saw Corinne Rivera get her hands in the air for the first time this season, not once, but twice. This after fellow American Ruth Winder had won the first stage. Micah Kroger ran out there, a winner overall though, after taking the second stage in a breakaway with Lotta Kopecky and Audrey Cordon Rago, with these three finishing in that order on the final day. The Cyclocross World Cup kicked off in the USA with the Jingle Cross in Iowa City, with the likes of Mathieu Van Der Poel, Mariana Voss and Lucinda Brand still focused on the road worlds, and with Wout Van Aert, who's always a big fan of the US World Cup, still recovering from his Tour de France crash, there are a few notable absentees. In a thrilling women's race, Canadian Magalie Rochette of Specialized Feedback Sports literally ran away from her rivals to win her first ever World Cup race emotionally ahead of her former teammate and mentor, Katarina Nash. And an absolutely phenomenal performance though from Clara Honsinger, who went toe to toe with Nash and Rochette throughout. In the men's race, it was a first elite World Cup victory for Ellie Isabet of Pau Sals and Bingo, who went clear at the midway point and came home ahead of last year's World Cup overall champion Telenet Balwa's Lions rider Tone Arts with teammate Dan Serta in third. He's a bit a target this race because of the ascent of Mount Crumpet that he felt really suited his 55 kilogram frame. We shall finish the show with the latest transfer news. Nielsen Paulus has just helped Primus Roglic to his win at the Vuelta, but he'll be moving next year from Jumbo Visma to EF Education first. Just after last week's show came out, it was announced that John Dibbon will step back into the World Tour after a year at Madison Genesis, finding a place at Lotto Sudal. The rumor has it that also there will be the home of Ruben Guerrero, currently with Katusha Albacy. Joe Dombrowski will move from EF Education first and ride with UAE Team Emirates. And in more rumours, apparently Carlos Bettencourt will be there too. Right, that's it for this week. It's a slightly quieter week coming up in the world of professional racing, but we do have the continuation of the Italian races in the form of the Giro della Toscana, the Coppa Sabatini, the Memorial Marco Pantani and the Trofeo Matteotti. There's also the Championship of Flanders in Belgium, the GP Iceberg in France. Basically though, we've all now got our eyes set on what looks like it will be a fantastic World Championships in Yorkshire. Let us know who you think will win the men's and women's elite road races in the comments section below. Oh yes, and I'm also feeling quite pleased that the GCN curse seems to not have hit GCN racing yet as I tips Primus Roglic to win the Vuelta. Dan is dismantling the shrine he built to himself after tipping Egan Bernal to win the Tour as we speak. If you haven't yet watched this video, I can thoroughly recommend it. Hank went to visit some truly inspiring people with Help for Heroes and you can find that down here. That's it for this week. Have a great one. Bye for now.